Good afternoon and welcome back to the 21st Annual Sirius Security Seminar. I am Joel Rasmus, Managing Director of Sirius, and it is my honor to be able to host uh, this afternoon's session, Technical Talks from Sirius Industry Partners. Our first presenter is, uh, there we go, uh, Protecting the Mission, a Practical Approach to Executing a Comprehensive Security Solution. Our presenter is Heather Romero, Heather is an engineering fellow, uh, with cybersecurity anti-tamper tech area director for Raytheon Intelligence and Space. Heather, welcome. I have been in the security domain for over 15 years, and I'm currently the Embedded Cyber and Anti-Tamper Technology Area Director. I am responsible for evaluating and directing Embedded Cyber and Anti-Tamper Technologies to provide improved defense and cyber resiliency for key systems. What does that actually mean? I help make weapon systems more secure. Most of the work I've done is on classified systems, and I can't discuss those here. However, the same security principles apply to commercial or enterprise products, which we will be discussing during this presentation. I expect that most everyone here has, or at some point will be responsible for looking at how to incorporate security in, in, into an enterprise or embedded system. Clearly cyber defense can be challenging and impossible to be 100% secure you can expect to be breached at some point. My master's professor used to say, you can work for a company that knows they've been breached or just hasn't figured it out yet. Attackers only have to get it right once. We as system security engineers need to get it right 100% of the time, a very tall order. I titled this system security as I wanted it to encompass more than just cybersecurity, the popular buzzword. I believe that providing the best defense requires you to think more broadly than cybersecurity alone. When approaching the challenge of securing a system, it's crucial to understand what needs to be protected and where the system security boundary is. What are the parts that you can secure? What is in your control? Today, I'm going to talk about the challenges, some lessons we can learn from failures and successes, and the areas that should be considered when thinking about system security. Developing products and deploying them comes with global challenges. 20 years ago, as we designed and developed products, security wasn't necessarily at the forefront of the process. We didn't have the connectivity we do now. We weren't accessing the cloud, didn't have the concept where the physical server potentially resided in a different country or location that wasn't easily accessible. Secure coding, static analysis, chaos engineering, these weren't part of the development category or conversation. Now that's all changed. And now we are taking these legacy systems and connecting them to the internet. As an example, think critical infrastructure like the power grid. It wasn't designed to be connected to the internet, but it's more convenient to have this avail information available at the touch of a finger. So it's been connected. However, how do you think that impacts the security challenge? And now we are adding new technology like machine learning and edge processing to these legacy systems or we're developing new systems with these capabilities. We're doing this on the cloud and we're doing data analysis and data fusion. How do we communicate that data securely? How do we protect it? The challenge to protect these systems has gotten harder. You don't always control the geographic location. It can be accessed remotely and you have the added challenge to account for every component and piece of software on the system. How many lines of code do you think are in your system? Have you verified every line? 
How many different components are in your system or product? It can be diff very difficult to track and configure everything. This picture is an example of the product lifestyle, life cycle, and each part of the process as a product is developed. As you can see, there are many steps and touch points where malware or fake components can be inserted. It's a cartoon picture, but you can imagine that as a product is developed, there are components and software that will be included from vendors across the world. Or you deploy the product globally and it's outside of your physical control. For a security solution to be complete, we need to consider protection throughout the entire life cycle, development through operations, through maintenance. How do you update your software and hardware? How do you fix things that come back to, your, come back to you? When deploying military products, the, the ones that I work on, we want to protect our information and products from being stolen or reused against the United States. On the commercial side, companies need to protect their IP and healthcare companies and hospitals need to protect health information. These are just a couple examples, but as you can see, this becomes more challenging as everything becomes more interconnected. Before we discuss how to approach security, let's look at how the threat has evolved. What are you protecting your company from? These are examples of several attacks attributed to nation states and there are three trends that have contributed to the sophistication of the cyber threat. Difficulty of attribution, realization by nation states that cyber attacks can get a point across, and being able to make money. An example of difficulty of attribution is the RSA attack. This was attributed to China. However, we couldn't identify the actual individuals responsible. We cannot hold individuals accountable, unlike when it's a physical attack. So the attackers become anonymous. Another example is the 2018 South Korean Olympics, where there was an attack on the Active Directory servers during the opening ceremonies. When trying to recover, the servers kept going back down. This included Wi-Fi points, high bandwidth access, electronic badges, affecting people getting into the Olympics. This malware was written to make it look like it was coming from North Korea, but it was really from Russia. Again, hard to do attribution. Another example is the 2020 Blue Weeks, where the hacktivist group named Anonymous stole and leaked information from over 200 state, local, and federal agencies. The information included internal memos, financial records, and more. Even though the group or country may be able to be pinpointed, it's hard to hold anyone accountable. This becomes an international or can become an international issue. Think of the Edward Snowden case. Examples of where the nation state experimented in influencing operations in other countries include the Google attack from China and the attack on Georgia from Russia. Russia and China were able to disrupt operations within another country because of these attacks. How about the example of a country being upset in how they were being portrayed and attacking the movie industry like when North Korea responded to a movie they didn't like with a direct attack against the Sony Corporation. The third attribute comes from being able to make money by doing these attacks. An example is the Equifax hack where personal identification information was sold. Other examples include ransomware attacks where millions of dollars have been made off of, the, off of these attacks. As you can see, the threat has evolved and become more complex, using cyber as a weapon to cause community and financial disruption. The result is defenders have to be knowledgeable about the evolving threat. When thinking about protection, it's critical to understand what threat you are trying to mitigate and how much that asset is worth. It comes down to how much risk the company will accept and how much money they want to spend. System security can get expensive. But we need to be realistic and practical when proposing a security solution. There are a few classes of threat actors to consider. The difference between them being their purpose for hacking and how much time and resources they have at their disposal. So you may have hacktivists who volunteer to do something within their sphere of interests, or you have hackers or organized crime where they're looking for data that can be stolen and resold or steal IP. And then you have nation states where they have unlimited resources and time and they're looking for an industrial or military advantage. And between hacktivists to nation states, you have a range where hacktivists are doing it on their own time and maybe on their own money or maybe no money.
to do something that they want versus nation states that can spend as much time and as much money and they have the labor resources as well. As I've mentioned, it's unlikely we're going to make a system 100% secure. However, we can add security mitigations that make it too costly for the attacker to be successful or take too much time that it's not worth it to them. Think about burglars looking at two different houses to break into. One has an alarm system and one does not. Which one is the burglar likely to break into? The easier one without the alarm system because that is less time and less skills that they would need. Don't think because you don't have super secret access, you don't have the ability to get the information that can help you be prepared. Here are two reports that come out annually and they can provide helpful information. They are the Verizon's Data Breach Investigations Report and the CrowdStrike Global Threat Report. Verizon provides information for threats against corporations and this can help you understand where to focus your security efforts and how to scope the problem. Some examples of the takeaways in the Verizon report from 2020 are, cyber criminals still use the most common techniques at the lowest cost to exploit vulnerabilities. Just as I discussed on the previous chart with the burglary example. Nearly half the breaches involve hacking, 22% caused by errors, 22% included social attacks, and 17% involved malware. Human error and misconfigurations are on the rise our applications and systems continue to be more complex, making it harder to secure and creating a larger attack surface for hackers. Cloud applications are highly vulnerable to conventional theft, and cloud was involved in 24% of all reported breaches. 77% of those cloud breaches involve stolen and compromised credentials. CrowdStrike provides an analysis breakdown of which malware was used, trends of how companies and people are being hacked, and shares attribution of mal malware to the country using it. Some examples of the data within this report are that ransom demand soared into the millions, causing unparalleled disruption. Cyber private criminals are weaponizing sensitive data to increase pressure on these ransomware victims. The e-crime ecosystem continues to evolve. An increase was observed in e-crime campaigns targeting financial institutions around the world. The trend toward malware-free tactics accelerated with malware-free attacks surpassing the volume of malware attacks. And state-sponsored targeted intrusions continue to gather intelligence and promote division within communities and possible collaboration with sophisticated e-crime adversaries was also observed. These are just some of the takeaways from the reports. While they highlight that we have a difficult job, these reports provide insight into how companies are being attacked and the information can be used to help us in securing our systems. Clearly we have a hard technical problem to solve, but we also have a cultural challenge. I've heard many excuses of why a program cannot include security in their solution. Cybersecurity doesn't apply to us because, in that sentence with your choice of words or what you've heard in your work. For example, cyber doesn't apply to my program because it's not connected to the internet. But as I've discussed, it probably will be in the future. And I have an example that I'll share later of how that didn't matter. Another excuse is, We've never had to do this before, so this doesn't really apply to us. Probably not something you'll hear on the commercial side as much, but I've definitely heard this many times when looking at defense programs. It's essential to include security for every program. Does your program include software? I would be very surprised if it didn't. I bet at a minimum you should be including secure coding, secure coding guidelines or software assurance practices. How about incorporating system security doesn't need to be done in the normal process, or it can be done after the fact if we find the need. Have you ever tried to add security after the fact or integrate a security solution into a developed product? Much more time and money are generally needed than if you had just designed the solution with security from the start. I've had many conversations with technical directors that tell me, well, I would love to include it. I know it's needed, but we just don't have the schedule or the budget. We need to be able to 
have practical answers when discussing these with our directors and be able to change their mindset so that we start incorporating security up front. As system security engineers, part of our job is to sell security and change the culture and mindset. Things to remember. We need to propose a security solution that meets the needs and addresses the main threats executives are concerned about. But caution is you determine what the risk assessment is. In my experience, humans are really, really bad at estimating real risk. Let's talk about a simple life, life example. Do you think about driving yourself as a risky endeavor or do you feel safe when you're behind the wheel? How does that change when you let your child drive on their own or drive with their friends? How does your risk posture change? Do you change the circumstances of when they can drive or place limitations on your child? like no driving at night or no phones in the car, how would it change for you in considering that situation? In the cyber world, your risk posture may change based on the threat actors you perceive and you need protection from, or how critical something is to your company. As I mentioned, we as security professionals have to get it right 100% of the time, or we're supposed to. To have the best chance of success, we need to look at system security as being multidisciplined, not just cybersecurity. These are the six areas that make up program protection as defined by the Defense Acquisition Guidebook. Considering each of these areas as part of the system security solution is recommended to have a complete solution. Cybersecurity is defending the system against remote attacks. At my job, the key to a system success is cyber resiliency where we can operate through an attack and be able to complete the mission. Things to think about is how can your system limit the damage or theft if an attacker is in the system? There have been systems where we've added mitigations making the assumption that the attacker is within and how do you limit what they're able to do? Anti-tamper is defending against physical attacks, protecting critical IP from being stolen even when on an attacker's lab bench. We want to ensure that someone cannot reverse engineer our hardware or our software and steal critical technologies. Software assurance is ensuring the software does what you expect it to do and nothing else. Being free of attacks, faults, or defects. Each of those can cause the same effect. Incorporating secure coding standards, performing static and dynamic analysis, and fuzzing tests helps to provide a level of confidence in the software. For supply chain, you want to ensure you don't have fake parts. You want to be able to trust the components and software in your system. Definitely a global challenge as many electronics and other things are made offshore. You have to be able to track your parts, have trusted partnerships with vendors, and be able to verify what's in the hardware you receive, which overlaps with the hardware assurance. Similar to software where you need to ensure the hardware does what you expect. And you want to be able to verify the hardware as is as you design and contains the firmware that you expect and nothing more. For operation security, you need to protect information and resources from those that aren't authorized. We should be aware of connecting pieces of information together that can provide clues to confidential or classified information. Let's look at some examples of how it was done wrong in each of these areas to learn from them. Here are a couple well-known military examples. In Iraq, insurgents were able to capture predator drone feeds and read them. The communications were being sent in plain text, so anyone scanning the area could read the messages. Cheap software was able to capture the messages. So the attackers didn't need any fancy tools or skill sets. They sh the designers of this should have encrypted the mess communications to protect the messages. Stuxnet was very sophisticated malware that crossed an air gap to affect nuclear centrifuges. It was able to hide itself so it wasn't detected. And it is the first discovered malware that spies on and then subvert industrial systems the first to include a programmable logic controller rootkit. Not enough just, it's not enough for us just to scan for malware. We need to also include behavioral analysis tools when we, to detect anomalous behavior. 
This is an example of very expensive malware and it was attributed to nation states. Remember, nation states essentially have unlimited resources and time. So this target was unlikely to be able to protect itself from the attack. The question is, was the amount spent on developing the malware worth the effect? We're not going to discuss that today, but just a reminder about risk that you're willing to accept versus the cost of the security solution. Potentially, success could be measured on how much you made the nation states spend and how long they had to, to develop that malware before they had their intended result. Stuxnet caused standards and best practices press practice guidelines to be published, providing direction and guidance for control system end users. They helped to provide guidance on how to establish a control system security management program. And the basic premise is that prevention requires a multi-layered approach, often termed defense in depth, similar to the concept we're discussing today of approaching system security as multidiscipline. Another example is WannaCry, which is ransomware, and on the rise, according to the Verizon report. With ransomware, a hacker encrypts files on your Windows computer and then asks for ransom payment, usually in Bitcoin, which is harder to trace than normal money. Generally, it targets known Windows OS vulnerabilities. So how do you stop this? Well, apply updates when they're released. Maybe that really sounds simple and should be for individuals but it's a harder problem when you think about enterprises that have thousands of computers. And then you expand that problem when you talk about not just computers, but maybe router updates and other networking equipment. We need ways to automate and authenticate updates and track system configurations. We can also create backups of data and don't store them connected to the PC, which is more of an individual answer. So if you store your backup next to your, connected to the PC, then the hacker can also affect your backups as well. Software assurance is a collection of processes and tools definitely incorporated within DevSecOps. One example of not doing simple input checking allowed a SQL injection attack where millions of user records were stolen. Input checking, buffer overflows, memory leaks, these seem like they shouldn't be around anymore, but they still are. It's important to have software developers adhere to secure coding guidelines and software best practices. And static and dynamic analysis are essential to do while developing software. Our software is only getting more complex. It's hard for humans to just do, to get by with just peer reviews. I often hear software is eating the world. Everything is being driven by software. It's becoming more complex, not simpler. Part of supply chain is being able to trust the components in your system. Ripple 20 is a series of vulnerabilities discovered in a low level TCP IP library. It's a widely used library and problems arise from the fact that the library was not only used by vendors directly, but also integrated into other software suites, which means that many companies aren't even aware that they're using this particular piece of code. And the name of the vulnerable library doesn't appear in their code manifest. So attacks exploiting these vulnerabilities can allow attackers to take over devices. An example is a healthcare device like a pacemaker, and this becomes a life critical situation. And you can see by the picture how many devices that this affected, affected library exists in. This is why it's becoming so important to know exactly what's in your system. When you consider using free and open software, so open source software, are you scanning every line of code, every library? Are you tracking updates to these FOSS? Another example concerned fake parts found in aortic pumps. These fake parts were defective, again, causing a life critical situation. You need to ensure a secure supply chain with trusted vendors and track all components and software. Meltdown and Spectre are two examples of hardware vulnerabilities. Meltdown breaks the most fundamental isolation between user applications and the operating system. This attack allows a program to access the memory and thus also the secrets of other programs in the operating system. Spectre breaks the isolation between different applications. 
It allows an attacker to trick error-free programs which follow best practices into leaking their secrets. Very hard to mitigate. This is most applicable to Intel processors. If your computer has a vulnerable processor and runs an unpatched OS, it is not safe to work with sensitive information. So you need to keep updating the software, keep on top of the patches. There are patches to help mitigate for both Meltdown and Spectre. Hardware assurance also includes verifying what's in the firmware to ensure it's what you expect and only what you expect. You can also scan firmware for malware and other things that should not be there. Operation security is not wholly a technical challenge. It includes people. And of course, people are always the weakest link in a security solution. In the military, they go to great lengths to hide locations or limit how information is tied together so that missions and soldiers are safe. This is an example of how social applications created an OPSEC leap for the military. Soldiers were using the same Strava fitness app and sharing their workout data. Strava correlated that data and released a global heat map. I'm sure this made Strava field users feel very connected across the world. However, it also highlighted army base locations. Because of the heat map, secret base locations, or what used to be secret locations, were able to be pinpointed, and now unauthorized people knew of the location. Although this is a military example, think about all the apps and social media sites you share information with. What can someone learn about you, your routine, when you're away from home? How about the cross-reference of all the people who work at a company? Could a hacker determine secrets about the company or who the vulnerable, vulnerable people are to exploit just from social media posting? When you think about applying system security, you need to start with your business goals. Understand what you're protecting, confirm with your business leaders, and ask them what's the critical asset or IP or technology that we're protecting? What is the risk that you're willing to accept? And how much money do you want to spend to protect it? You need to understand where the technology lives. What really requires protection? Maybe you can't protect the whole system, but you should draw a security boundary around where you need to provide protection. And that can help scope the problem. System security is multidiscipline. Consider all the areas of program protection and not just the latest buzzword. Build a team with a skill set in each of these areas so you can improve your skills in each area. Clearly, there are many examples of failures. I've only shared a few, but some examples of successes. Xbox and iPhone 11, they haven't been jailbroken. Uh, DVDs versus Blu-rays. DVDs use the same key for every DVD, and as soon as hackers were able to decrypt one, they could decrypt them all. But we evolved to Blu-ray, which issues different keys to different content producers. So one key breach can't lead to a breach of all movies. And they included revocation capability. One example I always like to think about is the Coca-Cola recipe. Somehow, Coca-Cola has successfully protected their recipe in all their years of producing it. System security can seem like you're tackling a problem that's too big, but hopefully breaking it down to understand the risk and what you're protecting in each of these areas can help you in approaching a solution practically. I want to thank you for joining me today and I'm happy to take any questions. Great, thank you very much, Heather. Appreciate the information. Uh, there were some questions that came up on the, uh, on the Slack channel, so let's start with some of those, and please, uh, uh, more questions uh, certainly come in. So the first question uh, is, th uh, thanks for talking, how do you recommend protecting against latent unknown vulnerabilities? Do you have architectural or preemptive strategies? Hi everyone, thanks for listening. Uh, uh, to answer that question, yes, absolutely. So when we talk about um, doing architecture and design and, and looking at security up front, we definitely, and, and I mentioned cyber resiliency, we definitely want to architect things in that will either notify you of um, attacks, 
um, or will help you li limit the amount of damage that will happen. So yes, uh, we try to structure that within our processes when we're doing security design. And we will walk through architecture assessments, kind of like a cyber table talk top exercise where we will uh, have SMEs in a room, we'll walk through the architecture and have them identify areas where they would have concerns. And so all those would go in before we actually do development and production of our products. I can't hear you, Jerry, is that? Or Joel, sorry, Joel, Joel, I can't hear you. Is that no, me? Yeah, I think you're still, you're muted, okay. <laughs> Yeah, so that actually uh, aligns fairly well with this intelligent question from this guy named Joel Rasmus, the serious has said, other than reviewing certificates, um, certifications, CV resume, uh, how do you assess your staff's actual expertise area? And are you doing scenario testing, et cetera, within Raytheon? So we have, uh, I'll say, uh, several different parts to that question. Uh, the first is, of course, as you're coming in out of school and you have some cyber background or maybe penetration testing or you've taken uh, some certifications, you know, CISSP or the Certified Edifical Hacking, um, and you can come in and then we have some training programs that will walk through different areas, whether that's systems architecture or we have software uh, security, um, Reese, a couple of years ago, they developed an embedded cybersecurity bootcamp where we walk through the process of doing the architecture that I mentioned and how you might do some of those assessments. And so we try to build the expertise within our company as well as hire, you know, of course, um, experts from outside. But we, as they come in, we try to help them give the tools and then we'll partner them with more senior uh, designers or more senior systems engineers or software engineers that have had that experience and then they can see the process within Raytheon. You know, every company is going to be different in how they approach the problem and the processes that they, they apply or their documentation required, but uh, essentially the concept is the same, right? You want to start with the, uh, and consider the security um, areas and approach. And so the six areas I talked about in terms of the, the pillars that we look at for program protection, they cover uh, different domains. So it's not just one person who's going to have all of that knowledge, right? But they're going to come from different functions. And so it's really going to be building that team of expertise that's going to be able to help you in all those different areas. And it's um, the point that I was trying to bring out in the talk too is addressing each of those areas. You cannot just go in and look at one cybersecurity or I'm going to make the software great. Well, what about the hardware or where are you getting those hardware components or how are you building it? And so all those things need to be encapsulated. And so we try to address that within our tra different training programs and in the different uh, people that we pull into the programs. Great. So not uh, directly related to the talk here, but, but uh, certainly the, the groundwork on this. Where do you see some of the growing areas of concern for both cyber and cyber physical systems as it relates to uh, uh, defense contractors like Raytheon? And I suspect, um, as we have seen for 20 plus years, you guys are some of the early targets, but some of those things flow down and hit every segment of, of industry. Sure. And obviously I'm not asking you to talk in a classified- uh, uh, Well, as I mentioned, you know, Oh, yeah. Um, well, a couple things. As I mentioned, right, the global challenge, and we have a lot of legacy systems. You know, the defense industry is unique or different, I should say, than commercial in that we deploy our products and they have to be out there for 10, 20 years. And it's, well, they get upgrades, but it's not like we get to revamp all the hardware or all the software. And so, when you talk about trying to connect some of these things, right, um, we have where we're, they're interconnecting and we're talking about edge processing and they're pushing more and more things out. We have to be careful because as I mentioned, right, we have these legacy systems that weren't designed for security in mind. And so that's one of our concerns. I mean, the other that you'll hear from the Department of Defense is that my trusted microelectronics is huge on their concern. Uh, we talk about the supply chain and, and being able to trust the underlying hardware. And of course, we're writing millions of lines of code across you know, commercial and defense and that, that software has to run on something and we need to hope that that hardware is trusted, right? And so I, I see that coming from our customer as a huge trend and they're putting money in that. So where they put their money is where their concern is in general, right? So um, I would say those are the, those are the areas.
Okay. You're on mute. Yep. Here's a great question that just, uh, that just came in. <laughs> if someone is able to hack or take unauthorized control of a weapon or a weapon system, uh, you have been responsible for securing, who is held responsible? That might not be a technical question, but it is certainly one that is uh, security related. <laughs> uh, well, I don't have my lawyers with me today, um, <laughs> but you know, that, that's an, it's an interesting question uh, and it's probably going to depend on what company you work for and what happened, what was the effect, right? Um, I, I think a lot of companies, um, you know, I'll say 10 years ago or five, even five years ago, maybe didn't ignore the liability aspect, right? But no more new legislation is coming in. I think they even now have cybersecurity insurance to try to protect you from, I'm, I'm not recommending that. It's just an interesting thing as you watch the legislation happen. So in terms of the defense company, you know, we're, we're, it's a different criticality than maybe somebody's information got stole, stole and sold versus we're talking about our soldiers on the front lines and that's a different sort of life criticality. And so for us, accountability comes down to, you know, that's, that's a, a lot of pressure, or say pressure, a lot of responsibility that we take and we try not to let that happen. And that's when it comes down to really saying what damage can we limit? That's how we design our products. But I, I, I don't think I have a great answer on who's held accountable. In our company, we have processes in place that if we discover a vulnerability or let's say um, we talk about the, the two Intel hardware assurance vulnerabilities that I mentioned in the, in the talk, um, we identified what programs were using that hardware and then we started implementing fixes. And so uh, it's not that any one person gets blamed, but we come down to um, coming through and seeing what can we do to fix the situation? What's the risk uh, identified, right? Uh, of how, much, how could it be exploited? So maybe it make it, it's real easy and then we need to get a fix right away or maybe it's hard and we can, we can wait. So um, I, I don't know if that fully answers the question. I think it's really dependent on the company and, and then of course the effect that is caused by the, the hack. So at the risk of uh, speaking for Raytheon, which I have no authority to be able to do, uh, I do know that from some of our past conversations and some of your peers <laughs> is that uh, this is why the testing and security has to be done right on the front side. Um, you can't follow the method that is often used, uh, and I'm not casting aspersions at any company or industry, but the idea of let's get the product out in the marketplace, and if we've got problems, well, Patch Tuesday will take care of it. And uh, when you're dealing with the defense industry, and as you have identified soldiers in the front lines, that it can't be, well, let's just put it out on the market, and if we find a problem uh, on Tuesday, we'll patch it uh, I know that your your company and your peers are are rigorous in making sure that uh, if not virtually everything, it's virtually everything that you can think of is tested on the front side to make sure that the security is there and that uh, if there is something that needs to be patched, it is a huge priority that isn't just a patch that's sent out once a week. Yes. So. Again, I don't mean to speak for you or Raytheon. I, I, I just do know that in our past conversations, that this is a huge concern to your organization and, and organizations like yours. Well, I think we have come uh, to- Yes, that, that is very true. And- Please. I was just going to say, um, there's a fine balance in and doing the testing because you can never test too much but if you you have to let it out the door at some point um but i know the our customer is also trying to move towards a more agile environment with real-time updates and so that is something as we move towards the future uh that we are embracing as well and another question just came in how would you handle zero day stuff Um, well, I, I mean, as, as we talked about Meltdown and Spectre were zero days and um, we, we got that information and went through all of our programs. Uh, there was another one that came through um, from another vendor that we had to address as well. And so um, we just come through with our, each program and we do a risk assessment to see 
is this something that we need to be worried about? What scenario does that cause? And then we work through with each of the um, directors on each program to figure out the, the right solution. So it's more of a program specific fit. It depends on where it's at, you know, the platforms, all, all these other questions that come into play. Um, and so that's, that's the process we go through. It cannot just be a one size fits all type of solution. Great. Uh, Heather, thank you very much for the talk, for the questions. But uh, since we do have a couple more minutes, I wanted to put out a plug in that I know that uh, Raytheon continue, continues to hire uh, great talent at every level, whether fresh out of college or experienced uh, cybersecurity engineers. Um, and so uh, are there opportunities within your space that, that, that you would send people to the website? To, I think RaytheonJobs.com, right? Uh, yes, I, I think it may have changed to RTX. I'd have to go now. I'd have to go find. But RaytheonJobs.com is going to take you to somewhere, and we are happy. We have lots of internship programs, and of course, hiring for full-time um, cyber and security engineers are always. We are always having a gap to fill those, so we are welcome to um, look at everybody. We were just at the serious uh, career fair that was a couple weeks ago, so uh, we are definitely excited and. Just as a plug for Raytheon, it's been a great company for me to work at. You know, we just merged with United Technologies, so we've doubled in size. And there's just so many different things uh, and areas that now Raytheon Technologies is a part of. So it's, you can never get bored, I'll say that. And the people that I, it's always about the people you work with and everybody is uh, very great and um, collaborative and it's been a really great career so far, so. I thank you for the opportunity uh, to share with you today. And I, and I do know that those openings are located uh, not just across the country, but uh, even some globally as well. So uh, we have a large Raytheon uh, facility just an hour from campus here in Indiana. Uh, I know that you've spent time in Texas and in California and, and obviously a number of Raytheon entities that are in the Boston and DC area as well as everywhere else. So again, thank you very much for this talk today. Uh, thank you for Raytheon's continued support of the Sirius program. Uh, and thank you for hiring so many of these uh, bright students coming out of our program who continue to report back that they are enjoying their career uh, working for you and with you and, and other Raytheon technologists across the country. So thank you very much.